translation of homily by Father Piotr Pavlukevich into English. Pokora potrafi działać cuda. Humility makes miracles happen. My dear brothers and sisters, the gospel story of the Canaanite woman shows us what patience can achieve, what love and patience and humility can achieve. Uh, humility is uh, a kind of important uh, uh, thing, an important thing that can uh, open up the gates of heaven. It, it could it could burst open the gates to heaven. Even if the angels in heaven would not want to let us in, humility will allow the doors to burst open for us. We can uh, achieve so much, uh, and that's why it says that uh, those who, um, who, who fight for justice and will inherit heaven. At the beginning of this uh, holy sacrifice of the Mass, let us ask for the Spirit, so that we will not be bored, so that we will listen, uh, not be bored and, and, and turn our ears, but to listen. So that we will not stand here today during this Holy Mass um, as if we are sleeping in our hearts. So, so that we do not fall into the trap that another Sunday Mass, just another Sunday Mass. No, it is the Holy Mass, and the Holy Mass is always something wonderful. Let us ask the Spirit to come into our hearts and set them on fire. And let us ask Jesus uh, to send us uh, the different graces that we will need to make it back to Him, to heaven. The Lord be with you and also with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel of Matthew. Jesus went to the uh, area of Tyre and Sidon. And when uh, a Canaanite woman from this area saw Jesus, she cried out to him. Have mercy on me, uh, Lord, uh, son of David. Uh, my daughter is possessed by an evil spirit. But Jesus didn't answer her. He didn't even say one word to her. But his apostles approached him and, and asked him, uh, Chastise her because she keeps yelling after us. So Jesus said, I am sent only to the sheep who have been lost from the house of Israel. And she came and she fell before him and she begged. Lord, please help me. 
dobrze jest zabrać chleb dzieciom. But he was very um, resistant, saying it is not good to take I rzucić psom. Uh, food, the bread and throw it to the dogs. A ona odrzekła. Tak, panie. But she replied, yes, Lord. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall off of their master's table. Then Jesus replied to her, Woman, your faith is very large. Let what you want to happen, happen. From that moment, her daughter Drodzy bracia i siostry, przeczytany przed chwilą fragment Ewangelii najczęściej interpretowany jest w takim kluczu, zresztą jak najbardziej słusznym i poprawnym. My dear brothers and sisters, we have just heard a fragment from the Gospel, which is often interpreted in this way. Że zbawienie świata dokonuje się w pewnym porządku that the salvation of the world happens in a way that is measured by, uh, by God. And some people will receive uh, spiritual graces early, Others will receive them later. And everything is measured by God or determined by God. Planned. Planned in such a way uh, like when you um, uh, are throwing, uh, like for example in the game of bowling, when you are throwing the ball and, and the pins fall down in a certain way. The, the Lord Jesus came to minister to the Jewish people. And to the to the non-believers, to the to the non-Jewish people, it was the apostles who were supposed to go to them. That was Jesus' plan. And in fact, when we look at that plan, it really would only transpire after several years, not from the very beginning. From the very beginning, Jesus was ministering to the Jewish people. And so when this woman comes to Jesus to beg for the health of her sick daughter, Jesus was by his silence, because remember he didn't answer her at first, he was he was trying to say that uh, it isn't time yet for salvation to come to you. Right now I have to uh, start with the redemption of the Jewish people, the, the central uh, mission, and then the rest will happen like, a, like when you throw a stone into the water and there are waves which which uh, promenade uh, indefinitely into the horizon, uh, like like the ripple waves that come after the first splash. My job is to form these apostles, to collect the lost sheep, and to you the good news will come, but after some time. But we see something unbelievable here, because this woman had very deep faith, and she was able to change the plans of God. In fact, there is a saying that says, uh, the aggressive ones, the violent ones, will... Um, will inherit the kingdom of God. That they will just break their way into heaven. That they will um, not be passive. Per perhaps the better term here is active. The active ones. 
duchowe, które jeszcze w zamyśle opatrzności Bożej nie były dla nich na ten dzień przeznaczone. And so this woman is is an active one. She's asking for the fruits of the graces of God, but at a time when God hadn't planned for this yet. To jest, kochani, też dla nas taka nauka. To nie jest tylko taka świetna. And this, my brothers and sisters, is also for us a very important lesson. Czysto teoretyczna prawda. This isn't something just uh, the theoretical. Teologiczna, ale dla nas jest taka nauka. And not just something theological. It's it's something practical. It's a lesson for us. Że muszą się pewne rzeczy spełnić. That certain things have to happen in a sequence. Muszą się pewne rzeczy spełnić, żeby do nas dotarła łaska Boża. Certain things have to happen in a sequence for the grace of God to come to us. My chcemy wszystko. But we want everything dziś, right now, today. Natychmiast, to co pan. At this moment. Ja to mówię, współczesny świat wychowuje nas w niecierpliwości. Ja chcę. Today's world uh, raises us and our children in a spirit of impatience. Wszystko, szybko. I want to know everything fast. Internet już mam jak... I have the internet at my fingertips and all the information I need I can get quickly. Domości, co, co SMS już was kogoś I can send somebody a text message and instantly transmit uh, my my ideas to someone. I can get any book I want from the library or for example from the internet. We don't know how to patiently wait. Kochani, ale chciałem dzisiaj spojrzeć na ten fragment Ewangelii troszeczkę inaczej. But my brothers and sisters, I would like to look at this uh, this fragment of the gospel a little bit uh, differently. Troszeczkę bardziej w wymiarze nie to, że Jezus tutaj rozmawia z przedstawicielką. Not not so much from the point of view that Jesus is is standing here speaking with this Canaanite woman. But to really uh, put ourselves from the point of view of the woman, the Canaanite woman. And and what what transpired from, from her point of view between Jesus and her. And I will say this right now from the start, that this which I am going to say is not something that I would consider to be uh, official, uh, like an official uh, church interpretation of this, of this gospel passage. And I, I've done a lot of reading about this uh, fragment of the gospel, um, and uh, there are several uh, various hypotheses concerning this. And my feeling is that these hypotheses are not just taken out of thin air, but uh, they come from somewhere. They have um, uh, an origin in uh, wanting to better understand this mystery that has transpired. Uh, but um, if there is someone here who is listening who, who says, oh, here uh, Father Peter is, uh, is kind of um, exaggerating things. He's being a little bit fake here. Well, I, I can't really argue with you. I'm going to repeat that um, certain fragments of this uh, gospel story uh, have been debated uh, over the years uh, by theologians. And some of the interpretations uh, of this or other passages are not always uh, um, comfortable or in line with a current dogma. But, you see, the Church has uh, positions on many, many different things within the Bible, and uh, um, but this passage is somewhat of a mystery, and so we have to uh, we have to use 
our um, spiritual uh, tools to dissect it. Niuanse różne biblijne, to Kościół jeszcze dopracowuje w pracy biblijskiej teologii. Kochani, wychodzi kobieta Kanan... My dear brothers and sisters, uh, this woman, this Canaanite woman, uh, is coming towards Jesus. And she is a non-Jew. And you must understand at this time it was not common for a Jewish person like Jesus or his apostles to speak with someone who is not Jewish. The relationship between um, uh, the, the Israelites, the Jewish people, uh, and uh, the non-Jewish people the best I can kind of compare it to would be uh, during the occupation of Poland by Germany, the relationship between the Gestapo of the Germans, of the German army, and, and the Polish people in the villages that were occupied. It, it was a, a very, very uh, shaky relationship. In fact, when a Jewish person, if he even brushed up on a Canaanite, he had to go wash himself and clean himself. In fact, when he brushed up against this Canaanite, he would have to spit three times in the direction of, Cana of the Canaanite. So there was lots of uh, procedural um, um, consequences for interacting with non non-Jewish people, especially Canaanites. There was a large, large um, dislike between the people, these peoples. And so here comes a Canaanite woman. Because Jesus had actually gone in the side of Sidon and Tyre, which uh, you you could encounter people that were non-Jews in this region. And so this uh, this meeting was uh, something that would be very unpleasant in the eyes of the typical Jewish people. It would be as if you were at some kind of discotheque or some kind of nightclub uh, and you're kind of having fun and drinking and being, uh, um, you know, not thinking very much about uh, uh, the soul at the moment, and uh, and a very holy person, uh, for example, uh, a very holy uh, priest comes in to this nightclub. It would be something unusual. And so it was uh, very strange that uh, Jesus. Uh, would sometimes go to these places like uh, Samaria or um, or places where you can encounter non non Jewish people. He went there to these people. That's unbelievable. Why would he do that? And not only did he go, but he went he went very far into their into their uh, land, uh, many kilometers uh, into their area. And so at the time, it was uh, in fact common practice to try to uh, plan travel so that you wouldn't even have to go to these places. And here comes a woman a, a pagan, a, a non-Jew, uh, and she's not only near Jesus, she's engaging him, she's crying out to him. Have mercy on me, Lord Jesus. Son of David, my daughter is very sick, she's possessed by an evil spirit. This had to have been an unbelievable type of scream. I mean, think about it. Put yourself in her situation. She's desperate. <coughs> Excuse me. Desperate. And she's screaming out of desperation. Jak on 
nie mając środków audiowizualnych. I'm very uh, uh, impressed by uh, Saint Matthew the Evangelist because uh, without without actually having a camera or or a film, he's able to really um, present the situation in a way that's very visual. He wanted to tell us. He used the word um, That that means a, a, an unusual scream, something that uh, you uh, wouldn't normally hear. He could have said a loud, a loud cry. He could have said. Um, he could have said she was just screaming her head off. But you know what he wrote? He wrote it in a way. He wrote it in a way that made you understand that this was a very, that this was a, a cry filled with pain. And it was very unpleasant. In fact, the apostles uh, said, do something about it. We can't, we can't listen to it anymore. Twelve apostles, they couldn't deal with it. Walking with Jesus, following him, listening to him, and they just couldn't, couldn't tolerate it. You have to understand, uh, anywhere Jesus went, uh, people were following him. So it wasn't that unusual to the apostles that maybe someone would come up to them. People would follow him, they would ask him for bread, they would, they would say, have mercy on me, they would ask for healing. Uh, because when Jesus walked with his apostles, uh, there were always large crowds that would gather and follow, follow him. So this, this had to have been some, not for real, uh, honestly, some kind of very painful, unpleasant, unusual scream. And the apostles were used to hearing the screams of others, or the shouts, the shouts of others. Please, can we have food? Please feed us. Uh, please heal us. And so for the apostles, they were used to hearing shouts. But this shout of this Canaanite woman, St. Matthew tells us, was so unbearable to them that they asked Jesus to intervene. How she must have been crying that the twelve apostles went to Jesus and said to him, please do something about her because we can't take it. So my dear, uh, my dear brothers, uh, um, you know, as men, uh, the, the voice of a woman could be very um, gentle and soft and appealing to us, but it can also be something that can really uh, strike our core, uh, like uh, when Samson... Uh, when Samson and Delilah were together and uh, the, the, the voice of Delilah was soothing to him. But with time, the voice of Delilah uh, brought Samson to a place where he couldn't bear to hear it anymore. Uh, many uh, men come to me and ask me to show them where that passage is in the Bible so that they can show it <laughs> to their wives. Because they want to write it down and have it, on a, have it on a card so they're ready to show it at any time. <laughs> But 
my dear sisters, you'll say, but I just wanted to talk to my husband. I, I didn't want to upset him. But he got very angry. I don't understand, Father. You can uh, make a man uh, go uh, insane uh, where he loses all of his patience uh, and humor uh, through, through uh, talking. When she, the Canaanite woman, shouted Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. All twelve of these apostles, they couldn't, they couldn't keep listening to it. Not that one of them went to Jesus. It was all of them. Jesus, please, let, let, do something. We can't take it anymore. So one could interpret this in a way that would say that this woman's prayer is a, an, an unbelievable example. She had a very, very uh, important uh, motivation for this. She didn't come uh, for money. She didn't come uh, having baked cookies to give some cookies to Jesus. Her daughter was ill and possessed by an evil spirit. This is one of the most important uh, types of illnesses to pray for. The, the devil is, is um, lowering my daughter. He is uh, making her do things that are evil and uh, putting her soul in jeopardy. She's begging Jesus. She's screaming. She's doing whatever she can. And think about, for a moment, our own prayers to Jesus. Many times we just kind of mumble our prayers and just get through them, maybe not even thinking too much about them. Sometimes in church, we don't even want to sing, we don't even want to raise our voice at all. Um, and so, you know, in our uh, Catholic faith, there are lots of moments where we are to express our faith, uh, we are to pray, we are to sing. Uh, and many of us uh, often uh, do this in a way with no emotion, very differently from the woman who was praying to Jesus for healing for her daughter. Many of us have been on something called a religious pilgrimage where we have uh, journeyed by foot to a holy shrine, for example, to Częstochowa, and uh, during this many days uh, where we walk together and uh, we sleep in tents and then we walk together and until we eventually get to the, to the, to the shrine, uh, to, we, during this pilgrimage we often sing, we often dance, we, we are filled with emotion and we are filled with uh, loud prayer. But in a parish church, uh, kind of a regular Sunday afternoon uh, or Sunday morning mass, uh, oftentimes the prayers are said uh, with very little passion. Even in our families, often we just go into our rooms alone and we pray so that no one even sees us, so that we don't share our prayers. Uh, it becomes a very uh, private thing. But this woman had a public display of faith uh, and, and shouting uh, very loudly. And she, and she was not just praying, but she was shouting, Jesus, son of David. 
This is not a typical uh, greeting. Uh, this is something that uh, recognizes uh, who Jesus is. Wydawać by się mogło, że powtarzam, ta modlitwa ma wszystko, żeby Jezus ją uznał, że jest to piękna, dobra kobieta i że zaraz ją uzna. And, and it almost seems like she's saying these words so that Jesus will turn around and say, oh, what a, what a beautiful prayer, what a beautiful woman. Look at her. She's doing it the way that everyone should. So, of course, I'll grant her her wish. But no. A Jezus nie odezwał się do niej ani jednym słowem. But Jesus, very surprisingly, he didn't, he didn't even answer her, not even one word. Shock. It, it's just uh, the best word to describe this is shock. She said this, what we would say, beautiful prayer, uh, public display of faith, and Jesus says nothing. How many times do we pray we don't hear a response right away. And we give up. But does she give up? No. But uh, it must have been a shock to her uh, to hear nothing. Now my brothers and sisters, um, uh, try to imagine when uh, people come to a priest and they say, my mother is dying. Could you come with us and bring her Holy Communion? And can you imagine if I just turned my back and didn't say anything? Could, could you imagine that? Excuse me. Excuse me, Father. Someone very close to me is dying. Uh, can you please come and give her last rites? And I say... I say nothing and I just walk out of the room. Can you imagine something like this? And I'm just a human being. But here we have Jesus, the Son of God. And what is he doing? He's not responding. And we know that his heart is total goodness and total love. I remember once I was at a religious retreat and Father Ojejowski said said about this passage that when come when 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 the reading uh, happens and they get to the part where Jesus doesn't respond to the woman the priests in the room they start to cough uh, they start to pretend like the microphone's not working. Like they zone out. How can we as priests defend this Jesus when he does something like that? How can we defend him when he didn't respond to this woman in need, not even one word? He didn't say uh, anything to make her feel good. He didn't say, oh, well, maybe tomorrow. He said, yeah, let's, let's hope that maybe one day. He just said nothing. Zero. And Jesus loved this woman. There's no doubt that he did. How many, how many women or just people in this situation would at this moment just uh, retreat, just back up, just give up? How many people would say, oh, you, Jesus, you think you're so great, you won't help me? You're, you're, you're a phony. You'll, you'll never hear me worship you again. How many people have come to church and asked for the priest to hear their confession and the priest said, I'm sorry, but I don't have time right now. And then they say, oh yeah? Oh, you don't have time right now? 
That's how you guys are. That's how you priests are. Just money? You just want to take the money on Sunday? But when we need you, you just tell us you're too busy? Well, then that's it. I'm not going to confession ever again. You, you know people like this, don't you? I went once to a priest and I asked, and he didn't listen to me. I asked for something. It's important to therefore realize that this Canaanite woman, woman uh, left her comfort zone. She left her comfort zone and crossed the border. The border of what? The border of her comfort. So she she took a risk. She decided to lay it out there at Jesus' feet. She could have said, no, I'm not going to bother him. But she saw the opportunity to come and talk to Jesus. And you see, we all have a comfort zone. We all have a, a way of looking at the world. And even though at that time, uh, it was not customary for a woman to approach a man, especially a non-Jewish woman approaching a Jewish man. She went out of that um, tradition because she wanted to uh, ask Jesus to help her. And we all have uh, a way of looking at the world. We also have uh, borders or comfort zones. Oh, someone might say, oh, I am uh, not so smart. Or someone might say, uh, I'm not so attractive. Or someone might say, oh, my dad was kind of short, so that's why I'm short. Uh, someone might say, my mother was the greatest ever. Uh, she loved me and I loved her. Uh, I have a brother who I can barely tolerate. I have this kind of chance, or I have that kind of chance. I pretty much understand how the world looks and how it works. And this type of thinking is our um, bad fortune, is our misfortune. This, it ties us down to a preconceived notion. It, it limits us. So, uh, what the Canaanite woman says is, come out of your skin, uh, come out of your comfort zone, um, break the barrier, and come. Uh, my dear brothers and sisters, uh, even uh, uh, as an example, how many of us have ever been in the hospital? When we're in the hospital, uh, we come back to the things that are most important. We start to think about our families. We start to pray. We start to say, when I get out of here, I'm going to change my life. I'm going to call my mother more. I'm going to call my dad more. I'm going to try to work out my disagreements with my sister, for example. Look, my mom, she's so great. She comes to the hospital every day. She's uh, Every day she's here, she brings me um, uh, some cookies. Uh, she... Uh, uh, but look, last week we had such an argument, but today she's here. Look at this, how she cares for me. She's even crying for me here in the hospital. How many people in the hospital have seen a different world? Looking out of the oncology room, window. Oh dear Lord, how great it would be to get out of here, to 
uh, to be able to walk on the street, to um, leave these worries behind. Oh, I would go sit on that bench over there and I would look around. Or maybe I would take the bus somewhere. You never thought that you'd have such an excitement from wanting to ride the bus. But here you are in the hospital wishing that you could ride the bus. The point of view that you have depends on the place you're sitting. She came out of her area. She came out of her boundary. She had courage to come out of that uh, area and come to Jesus. And it's like the Lord Jesus says, okay, woman. But you got to come out more than that. It's not enough to just uh, yell and ask for your request. Uh, maybe, like many of us, um, uh, she had a preconceived idea of how this might happen, of what of what Jesus might say. Uh, I will go to Jesus and I will ask for my request. I will cry. I will beg for uh, your assistance. And you will help me. Uh, in fact, many women uh, speak about their children like this. They uh, they cry to their husbands about their children. I will I will uh, ask Jesus. I will yell. I will uh, state my request. He's a good he's a good person. He will uh, heal my daughter. This is probably what she was thinking. And here's Jesus, kind of ruining her plan not saying anything back, kind of ignoring her. She must have really been uh, shocked. She must have been confused. She, she didn't think that it would go down that way. People would say, people said to her how good he was, how he has healed so many people. And here he is, just not responding to me. People say that he heals everyone who asks. And here Jesus is silent. And this is a very difficult moment for Jesus, in fact. But he's trying to get her to come further, to come further out of her limitations. Come, come closer to me. And now this is the moment where she has to make a decision. Either she's going to be offended and she's going to leave and walk away. Or she's going to come closer to Jesus. And so what does, what does the gospel tell us? She came closer to Jesus and she fell down at his feet. And she said, Lord Jesus, please help me. And every word is important, so realize that she came to Jesus. You see, in the beginning she was yelling, shouting from a distance. But here she came to Jesus and kneeled at his feet. In the beginning when she asked him, she was far away. Now, the next time she asked him, she was close. 
Ja nawet, kochani, mam tutaj taką koncepcję, powtarzam, może jak... And my, my dear friends, uh, I have an idea, and again I repeat, Profesjonalne egzegeta by to skorygował. Że ta modlitwa, to była i oczywiście szczera modlitwa, to nie... Uh, and the idea is that this prayer, this was very open and genuine prayer. Wątpię, modliła się i prosiła za córkę. She was praying and asking for her daughter's help. This wasn't some kind of, uh, uh, you know, preformed prayer that she was reciting. This was a prayer from her heart. She knew that she had power in her lungs. She was standing straight up. And she was yelling. And she knew that she could yell loud. And then, of course, she um, added the son of David. She put that into her, uh, into her shout for uh, at Jesus. But she was actually not Jewish, so she probably didn't even know what that really meant. Okay, she put that in there, thinking that that would probably help. Ale usłyszała, że gdzieś tak o Jezusie do Jezusa mówią. But she heard that that's a title that they use when they speak about Jesus, that people use that title. So she put it into her prayer. Upiększę tą modlitwę. And the idea was to make the prayer more beautiful to Jesus. I'll make it look very, very beautiful, this prayer. Kochani, to tak jakby twój kolega, ateista z krwi. This my friends would be like is if you had a friend who's an atheist, an atheist to, to the core. Like a total atheist that doesn't believe in God at all. And it would be as if this friend would say to you, when we're going to the mountains, we're going to wait. And we're going to pray. I naszej jasnogórskiej, królowej Polski, matki, oblubienicy naszego Pana Jezusa Chrystusa. Byś powiedział, ty, co ty się wygłupiać? And he's going to say, for example, let's pray and ask the, the Blessed Mother of Częstochowa to uh, bless our trip. And you, looking at your friend, would be shocked. You would say, well, what are you doing? You, you, don't, you don't believe in this. Co ty żarty robisz? What are you making a joke of me here? Tak samo ona, poganka. So it's the same with her, uh, a pagan, a non-Jewish person, uh, using an invocation that the Jewish person would use in prayer. Totalna, to nie była żydóweczka pobożna. She wasn't some kind of holy Jewish woman. Synu Dawida. Son of David, she said. Ulituj się nade mną. Have mercy on me. Kochani, ja wam to często powtarzam. Dear friends, I often repeat I know I have mentioned this before on other occasions but um, it's it's very possible to take a tragedy and um, make a, a pity party right make a pity party for oneself but, of course, there's always two ways to look at something. We can be a, a pity party and feel sorry for ourselves, or uh, we can try to make the most of the situation and move forward. How many times, for example, in confession, do I hear uh, people confessing their sins in tears, uh, almost uh, giving a confession that makes them look like the victim and how unfortunate they are? But it's not this way. Uh, in fact, uh, we have to realize that much of the sinfulness is rooted in selfishness. And even from the death of someone, uh, a relative, uh, we can make a, a pity party. Even a funeral you can make uh, in such a way that we have a pity party. And even in all of these things, in the confession uh, or in the 
in the death of a loved one or at the funeral, we can be very far from God. And far, like shouting from a distance far. She must have, uh, on purpose, stood a distance away uh, because she had heard about this Jesus. And she thought, well, maybe I can shout from here and he will hear me. I, I, I won't go right up to him because he will look at me and he will know. He will know that I'm not a Jewish and uh, he will look in my eyes and he'll be able to see into me. So I will stand from a distance. So the example here is someone can pray often, someone could shout up to heaven and ask God for something. Someone can be very religious. Someone can, uh, for example, read lots of books about religion. But to Jesus they will not go. They will shout from a distance and not come up to him. Because we always are fighting with the idea that uh, we can't let him look right into our eyes because he will know everything. We say, dear Jesus, dear Jesus. But we do it in a way so as to not make any eye contact. It was really uh, the moment when Jesus didn't speak to her. This was a radical change for her. It sprung her to action. So she decided to come closer to Jesus. And she fell at his feet. And so here she, uh, she fell to her feet. She showed Jesus. Uh, she worshipped through this act. Because before she was standing straight up. And she was shouting and uh, almost in a way asking Jesus uh, to come to her. Uh, we often, uh, as priests, uh, when we get together and we start to talk about uh, things, we often talk about how the new uh, clerics, uh, the, the new priests are uh, are different. Uh, they're not as uh, mor morally strong. Oh, no, no, I, I, I said this a little wrong. Uh, when they talk about the, the priest in, in the seminary, uh, they are, um, when we talk about the priest in the seminary, say, you know, these are different uh, students than we were. Uh, when we were students, we would see a professor and we would say, uh, good morning, professor, or good evening, professor. And we would uh, have a certain type of, um, uh, of respect to this uh, professor. And uh, the young students seem to uh, be losing these traditions. And so once it happened to me that I was once sitting in the seminary, and there was a first-year student uh, who was passing by. And he said to me, uh, I highly respect you, uh, Father uh, Professor. But uh, the way he said it, it was not with this kind of... Uh, tone, uh, head held high and almost with a smirk. And so um, we can bring this type of uh, attitude to our prayers with Jesus. Jesus, look, look, uh, have mercy on me. Look, look at all of this stuff that's going on. We could do this. 
But you see, this uh, example that the Canaanite woman gives is that she falls down at Jesus' feet and worships him and asks him to help her, but only after he was silent. Do you know why Jesus didn't want to speak with her? Because maybe in this shouting, that wasn't really the true her. Maybe as she shouted, this wasn't the true person. Do you know why maybe when you pray to Jesus, Jesus is quiet? If, you know, for years perhaps you pray, and he's quiet. Uh, people come... They come to the church and they they talk to me and they say, "Excuse me, Father. You know, I don't feel. I don't feel Jesus. I don't hear Jesus. I pray, but it's not so personal. And I respond to this person and I say." The problem is that you are not praying as who you really are. You are praying as someone who you think you should be for Jesus. But Jesus wants your prayers from the person who you really are. It's almost like a, a performance in a, in a play. But Jesus wants you, the true you, he only wants to speak with the true you. Jesus knew that this woman, as she shouted, as she shouted, Jesus, son of David, that it's almost like a performance in a, in a theater. And he told himself, I'm not going to speak with this person because this person is not really being their true self. But Jesus said to himself, most likely, if the true you shows up, I will speak with you. And she came and she fell at his feet. And here she asked Jesus for his help. Now she's no longer screaming. She's not shouting anymore. She's not uh, uh, lamenting anything uh, loudly. She just simply asks. Look at, look at the prayer she says. Dear Lord Jesus. Please help me. Not a uh, son of David, uh, but please help me. Not the uh, savior of the world or son of David or anything. Uh, she didn't even understand these titles as, as we've explained already. But simply, please help me. Please help me. Please help me, please, Jesus. And in fact, there was no uh, request in this second prayer for the daughter. The prayer here was for her, for me. I have a problem, Jesus. Dear friends, this is... Um, obviously, uh, an important moment. It's a difficult moment for many people. And probably for women more than for men. When they come to speak to the priest, they say, excuse me, Father, you can't believe the kind of problems I'm having with my daughter. 
You can't believe it. I have so much trouble with her because my daughter. And then I will usually say, um, excuse me, but how about you? How do you live with Jesus? Oh, I'm very faithful. I live well with Jesus. My uh, grandfather even is friends with a cardinal. I've been on pilgrimage 30 times, but let's talk about my daughter, my daughter. But I will say, no, I, 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 not, not of your daughter. We need to talk about you. And so the Canaanite woman, she also started from her daughter. Have mercy on me, Lord Jesus. Because my daughter, because my daughter. But then when she comes closer to Jesus, she doesn't mention the daughter. She says, me, please help me. Because I need help. There are people who will constantly speak about, for example, their father, or their wife, or their daughter, or their son, but never will they mention themselves. But she understood Jesus. Jesus then said, she understood what Jesus needed and said, Lord Jesus, please help me. Something very, very uh, special. She had great humility. She's not saying, oh, I always wanted it good for my family, or I always wanted it good for my marriage, or I did everything I could so that my family would be happy. She doesn't preface it with anything. Dear brothers and sisters, we often lead our closest ones, our brothers, our husbands, uh, the, the wives can often bring husbands, for example, to uh, spiritual healers. We often uh, go to these people. Or we go to a psychologist and we say, can you please help my husband? Or we go to a priest and we say, can you please help my wife? Remember how uh, two or three months ago I was I was telling you a joke about a man who brought his parrot to the doctor. Because the, the parrot was coughing. And the doctor examined the parrot and said, well, you know, here the parrot is healthy. The, the reason why the parrot is coughing is because you're coughing. And the parrot imitates you. You know why your husband is coughing? Because you're sick. Do you know why your daughter's not good? Because you're not acting well. You're the one who needs to be healed. First you. Before we heal this daughter, we need to heal you. We gotta take care of you first. I can get angry at lots of people, but you know, I could get mad at many people, but you know, maybe um, the problem isn't them. Maybe the problem is me as a priest. Maybe I, I have to work on myself. 
Maybe I have to first heal myself. And then, once I'm healthy and I go to people, maybe I won't be angry anymore. And I'll be able to help save their souls without being angry. Let's start with ourselves. That's why we're specialists of taking care of other people. That's easier to do than to take care of ourselves. We want to uh, save our daughters or our husbands, our friends or our fiancés. And you see the Canaanite woman, she, she understood. She had some kind of problem. It's hard to know exactly how big of a problem it was because there's not enough detail about it in the writing. But we can kind of imagine that she had some major problems. And she came and she came to Jesus. Where is her husband? In many other uh, passages in the Gospels, when it came to healing, always a man came and, and asked for healing. And you see, at this time in um, history, uh, the female had a, a lesser role in uh, in public society. To a prophet, a man would go. Not a woman. A man would go because this was a serious conversation. And a man would go and speak with a prophet. And that's how it was. Uh, we had uh, the soldier come to Jesus and ask for healing for his servant. We had a father came and asked Jesus to heal his daughter who had died. It was logical for the woman to stay with the sick child. She would take care of the child and the father would, would go to the prophet, would go to Jesus. And his job was to get Jesus to come there. But in this scene, we see, in this passage, we see that she came to Jesus. Not her husband. Maybe she was a widow. That's possible. But it's not, it's not uh, something we can assume that she was a widow because in another passage in the Bible, St. Luke tells us about how Jesus uh, raised a child back to life. Uh, and it says that the woman's son uh, was, brought, was brought back to health and that she was a widow. It said that she was a widow in the other gospel for this other healing. But here there was no reference to her being a widow. She's probably not a widow. So where is her husband? Maybe she never was married. Maybe this was a child of a, of a romance. Maybe she was never married to the father. Maybe this was a child of adultery. Or, or maybe she had a husband, but uh, he left because he couldn't handle it with her anymore. It was too difficult.
And maybe she yelled at him too much. She was obviously good at yelling. She had a very strong lungs. Maybe he couldn't uh, take it anymore and he left her and she stayed by herself with his daughter. Something obviously happened to her in life. Maybe we can keep uh, thinking about this a little bit. Her daughter was possessed by a demon. The demon made her suffer. Uh, there's no um, easy way to understand this. Um, when a child uh, wanders off the path, it's not always uh, the parent's fault. But oftentimes, there is a connection. This demon found a road to the daughter of this Canaanite woman. How did he get? How did he get there? There was a, a way to get there. Maybe in the family. Maybe in, in her parents. We don't know. But something was obviously non-functional that resulted in this happening. But I will repeat, it's not always uh, it's not always the fault of the parents. Uh, sometimes, for example, uh, a child becomes an alcoholic and the parents are not alcoholics. But it's obvious that we're tied to each other, we're connected. And one more thing. And it's one more important thing that can help us understand that there was something really wrong with this woman. My dear friends, how, how do we know when someone is sick? Uh, we can look at the drugs they take and we know that if they're taking certain drugs, those are drugs for certain illnesses. From the medicine, you can uh, see what the illness is. So, let's look at the kind of medicine that Jesus gave this woman. And the medicine was uh, an extreme uh, humility, learning or acting in a very humble way. This was the medicine. This is what allowed her to, uh, to receive her, her prayer. When she became humble, becoming humble was the medicine. Jesus very strongly humbled her. You don't uh, deserve anything, right? This is what he's telling her. You, you, you don't have a right to it. You don't have a right to this. The children of Israel have a right to me and to my healing. But the dogs don't have a right to this. And when you hear that, and you hear how Jesus just said those words to her, it's almost like the hair stands up on your neck. It's, it's hard to accept. The most uh, nervous priest would never uh, say something like that uh, during a homily. He would never say something like, dogs, leave the church. But Jesus said something shocking, something difficult to hear. You don't have a right to this. Jesus 
And Jesus is really squeezing her to the wall of humility. Stado demonów siedziało jej na ramieniu i mówiło spluń na tego prorok. And it's very likely that uh, the the demons were near her, telling her to, uh, to you know to spit on this prophet or to um, do something to uh, make him uh, look bad. Why are you allowing yourself to be humbled like this? Odwróć się od niego. Turn away from him. Nie dawaj się tak Don't allow yourself to be put down like this. O, kochani, ilu ludzi już teraz naprawdę by to nie wytrzymało. And my dear friends, how many people at this point would just walk away? Jak śmiesz tak do mnie mówić, jak śmiesz się odzywać, a ta kobieta. But this woman, she didn't. She didn't leave. A ta kobieta co mówi? What did she say? She said, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall off the table of their masters. When we look at the medicine that Jesus used to heal her, we can see that she was ill from 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 pride and she needed to be humbled and this is the hardest thing for a prideful person to accept this this is the thing that a prideful person causes them to have uh, uh, their hair raised on their on their neck or uh, or a sour stomach, or, uh, or a nervous tremor. We live in a world that constantly pumps us up with pride. Turn on the TV. Listen to... Uh, any TV show uh, or watch any kind of concert on TV and and uh, and uh, they'll talk for example about Woodstock and they'll say oh the young people that went to Woodstock were amazing they were wonderful they were uh, unlike any other they were the best Every politician will say, oh, our citizens are the smartest, uh, are the most um, uh, successful. And I want to serve these uh, wonderful uh, citizens of this country. From a little kid, we're trained to be filled with pride. They pump us up with pride. Oh, a little uh, child, if your dad spanks you, call the police. So no one can touch you. And we grow in this pride and no one says anything about it. Everybody praises us from uh, all over the place. This bank is just for you. This product is just for you. You're fantastic. You're fantastic. You're uh, smart. And we grow in this pride. And it's true that everyone is smart. Or has the ability to be smart. But this was a very difficult medicine, but it worked. The world would think that Jesus was putting her down or making her low. But as soon as this uh, medicine was over, as soon as the operation was through, when she started to speak with a different voice, with her true voice, 
with a humble and warm voice, Jesus said to her, O woman, in the old literature, um, in, the, in the old days, there probably wasn't a nicer way to refer to a woman than the words that Jesus used. Uh, in Polish, the word is niewiasto. Uh, in English, it, it means uh, wonderful woman. But this was a title reserved for um, special uh, women. It would be almost like saying today, uh, oh princess. And who did Jesus use this word for in his life? He used this word to refer to his mother, Mary. So he used this word uh, in, at the wedding feast in Cana to refer to his mother. When he was hanging on the cross and he saw his mother, he said, Niewiasto. This is a special title. Um, it, it doesn't just mean woman, it means special woman. And so to this pagan woman, this Canaanite, Jesus says, Oh, Niewiasto. Oh, special woman. This is beautiful. This is, this is the fruit of humility that Jesus comes to this person. Remember what Mary said when she said the Magnificat. Mary said, let it be done to me as you have said. She was humble. She didn't uh, say, no, I can't do this right now. She didn't say, I'm busy. She didn't say, this really isn't my plans right now. She said, let it be done to me as you have said. God doesn't take joy in putting us down. It's not what he wants to do. It's not like this. I'm all-powerful God, and you're uh, Gosha, or you're John, or you're Tom, and you're nothing. It's not like that in God's eyes. But God loves humble people because, because humble people will allow themselves to be saved. And prideful people cannot be saved. That's why she's screaming, she's shouting, uh, saying something about dogs. But, but God is unable to save the proud and the arrogant. But he can save the humble. And that's why that's why being humble can make miracles happen. You came to me in humility. I will save you. Niewiasto, a special woman, you're beautiful. An unbelievable uh, experience. Uh, a story in the Bible, a passage in the Bible that tells us how to enter the gates of heaven. This woman uh, crossed uh, her, her true self. She, she brought forward her true self. Something unbelievable. She was mobilized to show who she really was. Uh, 
Do you, it wasn't about her daughter. It was about her. Do you know why the problem you're having with your brother can't seem to go away? Do you want to know why the problem with your husband doesn't seem to go away? Because you're the one with the problem. And his problem is to help you. <laughs> that's that's what he has to do. And God is saying, wake up, wake up, wake up. Stop saying this whole time I have to uh, convert my husband. Oh, no one can ever uh, save my husband. Oh, he's, uh, he's hopeless. Oh, I, I went to Częstochowa, I went to every shrine in Europe and I prayed for my husband and he's hopeless. Not him, you. And he's there as a as a mixer. He's there to mix up your your life so that you finally wake up and you finally come to to Jesus. Or maybe you both have to be saved. And let me repeat, this is why we receive from God difficult people to love. And this is why uh, there are people born sick, sick children. The question always is, how can it be that sick children are born? The answer is that we... Through these children, learn to love, to love them, to love each other, and to love Jesus. And so, us priests, us doctors, the neighbors, this is a this child is a chance for all of these people to learn love. So that people could. You know, leave their televisions and uh, lift up their heads and notice something else is going on. Maybe the neighbor uh, would otherwise just be watching television every day, but now they have a reason to leave their house, ring the doorbell, and ask, is there any way I can help you with this child? Can I help you take the child to the doctor? This is why there are difficult people. The apostles in this passage, they wanted to fix this situation really fast. They wanted to get rid of this lady. Jesus, get rid of her. Uh, that's something like the idea of a divorce. Uh, bye. It, it was fun, but it's time to go. It got too hard now. I'll take somebody who's going to listen to me and be a, be a good boy. Brother, I'm not going to talk to you. This is your bedroom, here's my bedroom, and we're not talking to each other. And that's the end. That's how it's going to be. This is also a, a problem for us priests. Oh, we don't have time. We don't have time. The office is closed. Uh, I don't have time for you, sir. I'm sorry. It's a very uh, straight situation. And then the next day God sends someone with an even bigger problem to us. Somebody who's like got serious problems. And then as a priest we can say, Dear Lord, how come intelligent people don't come to me that want to talk about politics or sports, but only people with problems? The reason is, this helps to save our souls. This helps us to help other people. This helps 
This is medicine for our soul. So that we learn how to love. And God shows us this in this Bible passage. Let's all read this passage. And let's all uh, meditate on this passage. We are really in danger due to our pride. Our souls are in danger, especially when we worry about the sins of our friends or our close ones and not about our own. Of course we can pray for them. Of course we can ask God to help them. But this passage is the gospel of how to get to heaven. And pride closes the door to heaven. So let us be careful. And let us follow up with Jesus and be active in our desire to be with Jesus. Because the active ones are the ones who will inherit the kingdom of God. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.